Welcome to episode number 182 of CXO Talk. I'm Michael Krigsman, and our show today, we are speaking with Steve Miranda, who is the Executive Vice President of Applications for Oracle. Steve is in the unique position to really be seeing and shaping what's happening to the enterprise software industry. Steve Miranda, how are you? And thanks for taking the time today. Great, Michael, my pleasure. Thanks for having us. Steve, uh, please give us a sense of what you do at Oracle, the scope of your responsibilities and where are you focused? Okay, so uh, I'll give you a little bit of background. So uh, I've been uh, with Oracle 23 years, almost 24 years now. Uh, I today manage the development organization that builds our cloud-based applications. So both uh, the organically built Fusion applications, as well as our cloud-based acquisitions of Taleo and right now Responsus Eloqua, as well as our data cloud uh, acquisitions underneath those. Uh, and then here at Oracle, we take the development organization as everything from uh, engineering, product management, uh, product strategy, quality assurance, and now in the cloud-based model uh, delivery and to some extent the operation of those uh, applications. So that falls under my domain. Uh, in that 23 years, I've basically always been in development at Oracle. Um, started really in the financial applications, but, but really in different roles and responsibilities throughout. Uh, as we move to the cloud, obviously different roles and responsibilities there. Uh, prior to that, I came from uh, what used to be General Electric uh, Aerospace, which uh, was it's no longer, I think that's probably part of Martin Marietta or has been bought and sold several times, engineering background there. Uh, and prior to that, uh, with a math background from, from Stanford University. Uh, so that's a bit of a little background. Steve, so your uh, footprint, so to speak, at Oracle is very broad. Can you share with us the, the product areas that you're responsible for? Sure. Well, we, we try to summarize kind of the different applications into uh, a few different product pillars. And so just quickly through the product pillars, we have uh, obviously our uh, customer experience applications or CX, which is really sales, service, marketing, and social. Uh, we have our HCM applications, which includes core HCM, uh, but also talent management, recruiting, uh, benefits, payroll, and again, social. Uh, we have the financial applications. Uh, sometimes people will include procurement in that, sometimes not. But we have financials, GL, APAR, you know, procurement apps, project management. And then we have our supply chain manufacturing, a more recent entry, uh, which is core manufacturing, inventory, order management, uh, et cetera. Those type of applications all all of which cloud-based uh, applications, all of which really SaaS-based applications to be clear, not hosted applications. Underneath that, primarily today, and I know we'll get into this more, or, or really exclusively today, is our uh, data cloud, uh, which are uh, uh, third-party and first-party data that we both uh, partner with, uh, acquire, and uh, share with our customers, which is, again, the cloud-based data asset that drives either our or potentially third-party marketing platforms uh, around data. And we can get into that more in the course of this discussion. And just to help us uh, with a little bit of further context, very briefly, can you describe the quote unquote typical Oracle customer if there is one? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if there is one. So I, I would say that, um, let me say there were probably two quote unquote typical customers prior to cloud, which have remained with us in cloud, and then one new uh, emerging typical. I guess if there's three, there can be typical, but let me give you the three patterns, uh, if you will. So first off, we've traditionally served really the largest enterprises uh, around the world. So you know, our cloud customers include uh, people like General Electric, people like UBS, uh, people like HSBC, um, people like Kaiser in the United States, uh, you know, large enterprises across multiple uh, different uh, industries, both uh, uh, public sector as well as private sector. So that's kind of the, your, your large enterprise space, um, part, part one. Part two is we've generally done or historically done pretty well and continue to do pretty well in the cloud on these, let's call them fast growing, either pre-IPO or now some of which post-IPO, 
uh, companies moving to the cloud. So recent customers, I would say that's probably been a, a big sweet spot for us kind of in the valley here uh, and in California with so many new uh, startup companies. Uh, recently with the cloud, these are customers like Pandora Music, uh, people like uh, Lending Club uh, that are now post acquisition who are pre IPO, kind of really get onto their first enterprise system as they're growing at some point of their growth. Now the new spot that, that we're getting now with the cloud is a whole barrier to entry has gone away. So I would say we're starting to get into a more more common customer, let me say probably not typical yet, is that small and medium business who previously in the on-premise world had you know barriers of entry of data centers and, and machines and DBAs and sysadmins, et cetera, et cetera. By, by having the cloud-based system, we've gotten a much, much smaller uh, organization. So these are people like, um, you know, right around the corner here, we have the, the YMCA and it's the Silicon Valley branch of the YMCA. So really, truly small and medium business. Again, public sector, private sector, or, or, or kind of a combination of, of nonprofit like the YMCA is and other companies like that. That is becoming more commonplace as people at the smaller end realize they don't have that large barrier to entry anymore and, and find our solutions appealing. So you have got coverage across a very broad set of types of companies, industries, sizes of companies. One of the buzzwords that we hear these days a lot is this term digital transformation. And the cloud is central to that. So as you, in your unique position, what are you seeing as far as this digital transformation goes? And what does it actually mean from an Oracle perspective? Yeah, so I, I you know, and you'll find out in the course, I know you know this in the course of this conversation, I'm, I'm not really one for the marketing terms. So, you know, digital people, some people say digital transformation, other teams have, have big data initiatives, uh, other teams really are talking, or companies talking about moving that to the cloud. Um, you know, a common notion, I think, just to play on words, a lot of companies have now their 2020 vision, which is, you know, digital transformation. Here, here's what, what we see happening if you try to take away the buzzwords. Um, really, I, I classify it in two broad, broad categories. One is companies have a higher uh, demand than ever to innovate faster and to react faster to changing dynamics, whatever their industry is. I mean, a lot gets written about the, uh, the next Uber or the next Amazon or all these disruptive type of companies get into many, many industries. And I would say universally across our different sizes and industries of customers, they're feeling that pressure to innovate and respond and to stay uh, closer and, and, and relevant. That, that's one big category. And I say that because that spans, whether you're talking back office applications of HCM or, or, or financials or uh, manufacturing, as well as the front office. Now, the digital transformation part, uh, we see uh, most of the time it's a little bit talked about from the front office uh, side, and I would categorize that a little bit as follows. I try to summarize a theme, which is the way you and I and all of your audience and all of my staff and all of our customers and all of the, our customers' customers, the way we buy, sell, and service our, our goods and service are much, much different today than it ever was before. You know, you can find out information uh, about something you want to buy, not from that vendor. You find it out from Yelp or you find it out from a travel advisor or you find it from, you know, online reviews or bulletin boards. Your expectation of that customer for service is much, much different than it was before. You know, you don't expect to call them and, and be a put on hold. You don't expect, you know, even an email. You expect social interaction. You expect real-time interaction. You expect to trans transact with them on your mobile device or connected or phone or in person, you know, reasonably seamlessly, if not completely seamlessly. So I think the, the, the digital experience is really that responding to a modern customer uh, today and servicing a modern customer and marketing to a modern customer. And I would just put that more of the front office focus of this broad transformation. So that, that's a little bit, hopefully, I know you had a second part of the question, but I want to pause there to see if that if that makes sense, if that captures what what uh, what you're hearing as well. Well, it's it's very interesting. So, and you said you you emphasized the role of the customer and the importance of the customer and the customer expecting interaction. 
And so as you're thinking about this portfolio of applications that extends most, most obviously in this case, say customer experience, but even looking at, for example, ERP, how do you factor in this notion of the customer and the, the, the new modern customer as you're designing and thinking about the, these applications? Yeah, well, you know, every, every app uh, has, has their customer. So, so e ERP, you know, your customer for ERP may not be, uh, and when I say this, I say our customer's customer, right? So if we, we have, you know, General Electric, the big user of our cloud ERP, now their end customer, you as a consumer in, in GE Healthcare, you know, don't really see or hear it, but, but they've got their internal customers. And in that case, it's still real-time reporting, um, you know, uh, real-time, uh, 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 predictive intelligence off of the ERP system, so not just the static kind of, you know, retroactive, you know, uh, able to see it in uh, the multiple different devices uh, around the world and, and see it in the format that you want to see it as you move from phone to tablet to laptop, uh, et cetera, able to share it in a collaborative way to kind of share and work on documents and document sharing in a social way. And so those type of things sort of apply everywhere. They're, they're manifested differently uh, in the different product pillars. And sometimes there's different stress points in different industries. You know, if I were to bring banking into play uh, in, in kind of ERP, if you will, you know, the banking has kind of a regulatory aspect to it uh, that they, they want to bring forward. So, so, you know, our customers, customers are different for the different apps, but they all have, I would say, the same undercurrent of demand uh, that moves through them. So you're so you're thinking in terms of this um, this customer this what we sometimes hear about this empowered yeah. customer and so their expectations of you as a software developer are also changing dramatically. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know that the three this uh, you know another buzzword I guess is the consumerization of IT, if you will. But but we see it to be true, right? I mean, our user interface across the board. Um, when I started Oracle 23 years ago, step one, when and if anybody brought our software was, you know, learn the computer system, right? Um, you don't expect anybody to learn the computer system now. You, you know, people know how they expect to search for things, how they expect to buy and sell, how they expect to collaborate. You know, they have a common sense for what reporting styles and they, they want to see. Um, all that's, that's common. That's, that's what you expect to see. Uh, you know, recruiting, do you know how you expect to look for candidates and other, uh, you know, consumer type applications, how you expect to apply, you know, so that consumerization on, on, uh, on uh, UI is, we, we think, pervasive and, and across the board. Similarly, business intelligence, the, the you know, you, every web page you go to as a consumer now has analytics and reports and for more information drill here. If you're a shopper, you have recommendations. I mean, that, that business intelligence and drive business intelligence, we think is, is table stakes. It's a consumerization of IT. And then I've kind of probably mentioned those first two, but social is, is sort of uh, blended in. I mean, uh, you know, uh, you said you, you tweeted out this, this, uh, this forum beforehand. We're take, taking tweet, tweet questions during the broadcast. Uh, we're going to tweet out updates during the broadcast. We just expect it as a native way in the way we interact. And the same is true, not necessarily public, uh, um, you know, tweet or Facebook or things like that, but the same concept of sharing, uh, of, of, you know, a collaboration is again common. So between UX, BI, and social, it really underpins everything we're doing. I want to remind everybody that we're talking with Steve Miranda, who's the Executive Vice President of Applications at Oracle. And you can join the tweet chat that's going on right now and ask Steve questions with the hashtag CXOTalk. Now, Steve, you have this broad portfolio, and I know you think a lot about the individual applications, but you're also thinking about it as a software suite. And so can you tell us about that? So what is a suite and what are the challenges of creating a suite and why is it so important to you? Okay. So I think that first off, what is a suite? The suite is really our collection of applications from what I mentioned at the beginning, HR, financials, supply chain manufacturing, and CX or customer experience. Um, we, why it's important, why we feel it's important to our customers is that while in every area, 
you know, we have to compete against best of breed players or against players who also offer a suite or a subset of the suite. So certainly we don't feel we can get away with, um, you know, being non-competitive at any big area or the suite trumps that. So we stay very focused in the individual product pillars and my team stays focused to be very, very competitive. That said, what we also find is that for our customers, integration is a cost and it's not a, uh, you know, a, a, a subscription or license cost to us or our partners or anything else. It's a, it's a data cost between the two uh, systems and it's a business process cost in terms of how you orchestrate what goes where. And in many, many cases, while a customer may need a best of breed in a particular area that makes a difference for them, once they've picked that area as far as what's really differentiated for their business, um, they will get faster value add and time to value by adding the next application in an integrated suite. It's, it's faster to add, it's uh, more economical to them to man manage and maintain, and it doesn't have this integration. Now, just, just two points, if I may, to, to stress that, those points of emphasis differ by customer, by, by industry. So I, was, I, I just spent a tour in Asia across a lot of financial services. They were really keen on this digital transformation and looking to get at marketing uh, and service as their, with underpinnings of social as their key touch points. Uh, was one example. We have retail customers in the United States who have a lot of pressure in the HCM area and especially around recruiting. Um, we have other customers who have a talent management uh, a challenge. They really want to have talent management as their differentiator going forward. We still have some customers who are, or maybe you call it a public sector customer, who have a, an issue around their financial model, financial controls and risk uh, there. So that is their differentiated app. Once those customers have the differentiated app, if they have the Oracle suite, then things like if you implement HR first uh, and, and you go with our HR, well, a lot of what you set up in HR, you also set up in financials, your, your org structures for approvals, your legal entity structure and your business unit structure for security or reporting, et cetera. And that is a shared in our suite of applications. So you don't have to reset that up. And so in some ways, when I talk about the cost of adding the next piece, You've already done a lot of the work in terms of setup configuration to add your next module going forward. And, and that's really what we see is at the beginnings, while the cloud is, you know, you can take your pick whether in the first, second, third, fourth inning of the, of the transformation, you know, certainly the people moving the suites in cloud, we think is just as an inception. You mentioned, Steve, this notion of points of competitive differentiation. Can you elaborate on that? Because I think this is one of the, the points of confusion that many enterprise customers have determining or separating what are quote unquote commodity processes from their really unique, unique differentiating, differentiable points. Well, yeah, so I'll go with ours. I think it's fair that once, particularly now in the cloud, once you get to a top, uh, few of our competitors, and I would put us in that category as well. Um, if you're just looking at the baseline process of these, I think you're gonna have a really difficult time uh, uh, differentiating. What, what I think uh, you would look at, at Oracle in the cloud as being uniquely differentiated. Um, one is I think we bring some unique value propositions and history in security. Uh, two, I think we bring a tremendous amount of depth in terms of scale and globalization. So for larger enterprises, cover, particularly in regulatory areas like financials and HR, uh, and then anything you want to deal in volume. And three, I think we bring a uniqueness in terms of data, not just BI embedded in the applications, but added to that predictive capabilities with through BI and predictive analytics. And then the underpinnings of our data cloud, which, which we really feel is unique in an enterprise space of combining third party data with your first party data. By third party data, I mean data we collect over the internet to give you better decision making in your application or better customer targeting uh, even to people you don't know as a first party to your enterprise. And so I, now I can get into differentiators in financials and HR, manufacturing and, and the CX area of sales service marketing. But I think broadly, if you look at uh, data security or overall security, if you look at depth and breadth, and then if you look at data, those would be our three kind of broad differentiators across our suite. 
And what about customers who are looking at their own operations and trying to separate out what what is what can they use uh, out of the box? What should they use out of the box? And where should they be tailoring? Because that part of the business really is genuinely unique for them. Yeah, well, that that a little bit gets to back to my best of breed. So first off, to hopefully repeat, uh, but but to clarify, we and again, like most of our SaaS vendors, and this is why I pick SaaS. So we don't allow anything. Uh, we it's technically impossible to customize our application SaaS. By customize, I mean anything that would preclude our upgrades, which happen twice a year, or that you'd have to reapply after the upgrade. However, in to facilitate that, we put a tremendous amount of effort in our new cloud build to have extensibility uh, and allow you to personalize or tailor either for your company, either for your country, or for just your biz, or, or or for uh, uh, your business practice, the uh, the way that the system operates. Even with that constraint, what we try to advise our customers when we work with them is, you know, we think we have a lot of preceded out of the box best practices. We've worked a lot with our customers, both our cloud customers and have the benefit of a lot of on premise customers to tune that and learn over the years uh, from mistakes we've made, and mistakes they've made. So we really try to steer our customers into that area that matters most for you. So when I went through the banks and their marketing and service, when I went through the retailers and recruiting and talent management, when I went through public sector and financials, when it really means a lot to you, um, that's an area you, you know, probably makes sense to configure and to personalize more. But if it's an area that doesn't make a difference for your end stakeholders, you know, we feel pretty confident we have a good out of the box product and we'd advise customers to stick to that as much as possible. So really you, so to the extent that, as you said, to the extent possible, the customer should not be trying to change the, the basic processes. Yeah, and, and I think, I think you know, it's interesting when I, I dealt a lot with customers uh, at the beginning of my career, and then I took a bit of a pause really when we were building our, our SaaS-based applications and, and come back to it. And I, I, it was interesting, I think customers, the, the fact that, that, that it can't customize, the fact that uh, almost psychologically it's a pay-as-you-go model, and, and maybe the increased business pressure a lot, are a lot more geared towards phased projects you know, let's go live with phase one, get some value out of it, go forward. And so I think really customers just over the years have gotten a lot more disciplined about that aspect as well, about conf even configuring or personalizing, whatever term you want to use, um, only when it's going to make a difference and only when it's needed. But yes, if they need a little help, we certainly push that part. That's, it's interesting what you said about phased projects, because yeah. my sense is that for many customers, they're doing everything that they can to avoid the, the very large style, say, ERP projects yeah. of the past. And yeah, I, 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 it was, again, it was interesting. I sort of had this pause there in terms of deep customer engagement when we were doing much of the build. And uh, I guess it was very, very common <laughs> for us and our competitors in the on-premise world, you know, you'd have a scope, but inevitably something would change in your business problem while you had this long implementation project. So you'd change the scope. And I think because of the delivery model where people looked at it, look, I'm gonna get this delivery from, you know, Oracle who, or whoever once every couple of years, and I'm gonna upgrade once every maybe five years that, you know, I, I've gotta get this in. Uh, and I think in our SaaS model with the more frequent delivery, customers are, it, it lends itself much more to that phasing. And, you know, we like to describe it in our development as the trains leaving the station, right? It's, it's a very regular cadence uh, that, that hopefully it's on time train, but anyway, leave that aside. The trains leaving the station, it's much more regular cadence. And so what we found is I think that has helped customers really break it down. And it's also helped, you know, both us and our customers because they get that value of the initial go live, right? And you ha in some ways have that as a proof point you learn from that, you change. So I think a lot of things is fed into it. And I think the SaaS model is, is, is one big piece of it that's led customers towards that phased approach. What are you, you must uh, deal with IT folks, CIOs and, and IT leaders yeah. all the time. And so what are some of the implications of this on the CIO, on IT and on the relationship that IT has with the business that you're observing with your customers? 
Yeah, it, it's, um, so I think it's changed over the years and I think it's, it depends on where you are geographically uh, and where you are in the suite. Um, you know, certainly uh, the CX, the customer experience has been much more accustomed to the SaaS based model early. Uh, I think uh, you're starting to see that in HCM as well. That is pretty commonplace at this stage. Uh, I think we're just at the beginnings with, with ERP. And I, I think that to, at the beginning of the transition phase, um, either the skepticism or the pushback, if you will, is that this isn't, there, there's some efficiencies gained from, from IT and IT uh, you know, being changed where we're, we're providing, we are competitors are providing, you know, the, the, the services, the DBA, the hosting, et cetera. But uh, IT still has a big role in terms of change management, you know, introducing the new features, helping it roll out in terms of interaction with other parts of the ecosystem. Because even if a customer had applied our suite, chances are they have uh, a lot of other applications, be it on-premise or in uh, separate clouds. And so I don't view it as uh, there's some replacements of IT, but it's very much a refocus of where IT can really add value. Um, and in fact, you know, if you go, you know, the chief information officer is a kind of an interesting uh, title, which I still think is very, very uh, uh, relevant to what IT departments can do. Um, hopefully we are enable them through the SaaS based products of not doing, um, you know, let's call a commoditized task or no, certainly non-business value add task of just keeping the lights on, running the system, et cetera, but in being much more of that you know what the title implies chief information officer driving the business and helping the business consume not just the, the commodities of technology but the information that comes after that you know using that information to make decisions and to change business process i think that transformation once you get past what i'll call the initial pushback sometimes uh it is really what we're starting to see happen now that's an enormous uh impact positive impact for the cio for the and for IT, uh, yeah. where they can they don't have to focus on uh, on these commoditized tasks, so to speak, and they can focus on higher value activities. But it also forces a significant change inside IT as well. Yeah, I, I think you know even even with our own development engineers uh, and in our industry. Look, I, I said at the beginning. The industries, whether you call it uh, move to SaaS or digitization, is all about you know avoiding this disruption and, and moving more quickly. I think what you've dealt then with the IT role is just a you know a segment of this shift that's happening across our industry and how they have to change. But I truly believe there's a lot of uh, opportunity. It's frankly uh, more interesting work. Uh, I mean, I could tell you we within my development team, uh, one part of it implements our software here at Oracle. And it's a much, much more interesting discussion when we get to influence our business practices and how, how we do things here at Oracle and why and understand and work with the business than it is, you know, uh, let's get, you know, in the old days, let's get the upgrade done of, from version X to version Y. Uh, it's a much more engaging activity and much more value add activity. So it, it's, it's interesting to hear that inside your development organization, the shift to cloud has driven quite a, quite a lot of change as well. Maybe, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on that. I think that's quite, quite fascinating actually. Yeah, well, I, I think, so I probably tossed out the two broad brush strokes, right? One is that the, the, the speed and the train leaving the station model has got us to a more of a single code line incremental development work. And so even training ourselves towards, you know, uh, product managers and engineering, oh, this feature's got to get in, it's got to get in. I mean, I'd love it if more features got in. I'd love it if we developed faster. But, but frankly, with the more frequent cadence, we are very much in the train leaving the station model. And it's got us into more incremental. That, that's probably one big class of change. The second big class of change is, look, we get feedback on our software now uh, immediately and broadly and, and very precise. So we used to do, uh, you know, the best job as we could in product management and decision making, but that was we'd go to user groups and we'd visit customers and we'd see things. But, you know, the old model was we had, we'd release a product once every couple of years, maybe a customer was running it, you know, two years after we, we released it. So we'd be well onto the next release before we had any feedback whatsoever. And then that feedback, all of our customers had customized, they had different versions, it was anecdotal. Today, you know, I find ourselves more and more almost every day asking our product managers, 
you know, we have this go left, go right decision on how you design the software, what's being used, what features. It's like, well, we could survey the fleet, meaning we run it here. We, we're not looking at anybody's data, but we're looking at things like, how many people are using this feature? How many people are not using this feature? You know, what's the speed of certain features? What's the, you know, how many features in, are in common? Is it a certain profile of customer that uses one thing over the other? And so maybe we can tune the application better that way. So product management by fact is, and, and immediately is a dramatic shift. Um, and though it might seem simple, it, it's culturally been an interesting exercise just to change the way we think. So all of that, I assume, has made the development organization, the engineers, everybody associated with it, much more, uh, say, attuned to, to what the customers needs because they're, they're seeing the data in front of them. Yeah, there, well, there's no question. I would put it broadly. We, you know, we, we were a product company and we are uh, a service company or we are quickly becoming a service company. There's no, no doubt about it. Um, we are getting, I, I used to say uh, we wanted to be an extension of our, of our customers' IT organization and we did the best. I hope, you know, we haven't changed in terms of we used to be very customer service first and focus on the customer. But again, frankly, uh, we did that within some limits, right? If you're releasing the software and a customer, you know, starts using it three, four, five years later, um, it's just difficult to stay as responsive and, and, and to stay as real time, you know, giving them what they, what they needed. Oftentimes by the time they got it, we had moved on. Now we're just much closer to the customer in, in many, many, many respects. This role of, uh, of data, which you've yeah. spoken about quite a bit is very central. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, the data product that you mentioned earlier and just your, your view of, data sure. in this digital transformation world. Yeah, well, so, so as if for, for recap for, for people, our, our data cloud is really a combination of acquisitions we've made from companies like Blue Kai, Data Logics, and Addis. And what the data cloud is, is it provides us what we call third party data. So data that Michael, you and I uh, uh, produce as we, you know, um, either from a website traffic, so via cookies, uh, from mobile ID with data we collect from mobile partners, uh, from uh, credit card information that we have from credit card providers, and from some, uh, let's call it first party people. So we have a, a partnership with Polk, so we have data on like automobile uh, buying and selling with the United States. Where it's heavily deployed today, and you probably see it, is within our and sometimes in third party marketing clouds. So, you know, I'm sure if you clicked on uh, let me pick one of our customers so it's accurate to use our data cloud. If you clicked on Dell.com and you were searching for a computer, I'm sure very shortly there afterwards, you would start to see advertisements, uh, you know, maybe on your Facebook page or on any website you went to, your Yahoo News or what have you, uh, or maybe in your Twitter stream um, for computers uh, and, and Dell. And that's used for targeted marketing. And that's used with a collection of not only do we have the data of what activity you, you may or may not have been doing in an anonymized way, but we have a reasonable uh, a chance of matching what we call an ID graph. And the ID graph is this anonymous person on this browser is likely this person's uh, uh, a Twitter account, is likely this person's Facebook account, is likely this person's mobile ID. So it's allow a marketer to do multi-channel. So if you think about the way marketing was done before, uh, there used to be marketing segmentations and maybe they market to you, um, maybe to know, you know where you lived and maybe your income level or credit rating and maybe some form of interest, but more than likely your interest would be you know, based on where you were from and your gender and your age and your, your economic status. And they say, oh, those type of people are interested in cars or phones or, or what have you. That used to be quote unquote targeted marketing. Today, targeted marketing is still those anonymous levels, but it's somebody who you know has shown a genuine interest based on activity on this good and service, and they've shown it today. So it could get much more precise on the audience. It could get much more precise in the delivery mechanism, meaning through web, web or through social or through email, if, if you happen to be like a loyalty member of this company, et cetera. Um, and it could be, um, uh, you know, much more precise in terms of the, um, the the time that somebody's interested in it. So if you think about it, what marketing has done is it's gone by using external data combined maybe with internal data, like if you were a loyalty customer, it's gotten much more real time, much more precise and much more multi-channel. We think that that data cloud 
is just as it's beginning to be able to offer people more applications, let's start in CX, to extend it to service so that when you call for a service request, you have that information, to accept it to e-commerce, to have the next best offer, not just next best offer if you've bought something from me, but next best offer if we know you've been interested in other things uh, out on the internet, um, which is kind of commonplace. And, and our view is that we're just at the beginning. Uh, if you take even areas like our supply chain uh, area, you know, we feel we have a very strong supply chain planning product today, but it's mostly your internal data, right? How much did I sell last year? How much am I going to sell this year? What's my supply chain look like, et cetera? There's a bunch of external data. Um, and when you hear things like machine learning and more decisions and predictive analytics, you know, we think data is at the heart of that. And if you have this, you know, we think we got a unique or you know near unique, uh, certainly differentiated data asset, uh, and we can now use it to deploy it to make our apps better and smarter. And you're already seeing it today in marketing. Can you uh, elaborate on the role of data, this this kind of new role of data in areas like ERP and HCM? It's pretty clear in customer experience, but what about these these other areas? Well, the, the first thing I'll say, especially in HCM, you know, we have, I, hopefully I mentioned anonymous uh, a couple times during talk and privacy. So we're very conscious of making sure the data is anonymous and stays privacy. There are evolving regulations, uh, and unfortunately for us anyway, those are evolving different in different parts of the world. So with a big underline that we're cognizant of all that, but what, the way I think it will evolve, if you, I gave you the supply chain example, if you look at financials, um, there's different things you can do on uh, whether or not you want to offer a discount um, or, or, or a supplier if you want to take an early payment discount or not based on real-time external currency data, based on real-time data about that uh, particular supplier, based on uh, perhaps commodity prices of that good or service you're buying. So again, external data which could influence that decision and have, I, I don't really like the term machine learning, but let's just say, because uh, I think it's sort of, usually oversold, but let's just say more, uh, uh, you know, programmatic analytics around that. In HCM, you know, the recruiting example, I think is, is a very good one, right? To recruiting to some extent, it's about finding the right candidate, but you're also marketing the potential people you want to hire. And so I would classify recruiting today, very similar to the way marketing was in my, you know, old new example before where, People go to job fairs and people look for certain profiles and go to certain, uh, you know, job boards that have, you know, specialty areas. Job boards of kind of, you know, this group has high tech people and this group has other type of people. But you can find out a lot more information about individuals now, either first party or third party, to help you better target uh, candidates. And again, that's just another example of where we see it evolving to have external data respecting the anonymity of it and respecting the privacy regulations, which are evolving. Um, but one way or the other, you know, external data is what's going to drive processes. And in, in the in the kind of manufacturing world or in, in other parts, you know, this internet of things is the same thing. Collect as much data as you can, use that data to make better products. And, and that's where we think it's going to go in SaaS. So you're spending, it sounds like, uh, quite a lot of focus time on this role of data in the various enterprise applications that, that you're developing. New, new uses of data, not just data as in, as in on premises. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think first and foremost, you know, again, we are, we are, we're growing, but relative to Oracle, we're, we're near the beginnings. We're spending a ton of time making sure our customers are successful with what we have today. Number one. Number two is obviously we're expanding those in ways that you would expect us to expand as our products grow and mature. And then kind of the forward looking, yeah, you know, we, we really feel strongly on data and how it's going. And you see it really again in our CX uh, where it's, it started. And, and it's, I would say it's reasonably commonplace in marketing today uh, how, how it gets applied either from us or, or somebody else, either internal or with the external data. I mean, most companies are trying to, to use some flavor of what I described. Steve, we have just about five minutes left, and I thought it would be interesting if you can offer advice on for customers on how to be, this will sound strange, on how to be a, a good software customer because the relationship works both ways with customer and supplier. And I know many companies, I mean, the relationship, whether with any, any software vendor is uh, sometimes fraught. So what advice do you have for customers on 
having a good working relationship with a with a software vendor or with or with Oracle. Yeah, so I, I hopefully this answers your question. Two things maybe repeat. So I apologize. One is pick the area that is really differentiated for you and going to make a difference to your stakeholders and make sure that there's a good fit or the product is flexible enough to personalize to uh, to your needs. The second sort of corollary to that would be if you find yourself in an area where that's not it, um, uh, don't don't and you, you shouldn't be you know pushing uphill against the software in that you know in a non-differentiated area. Um, again, we think uh, we think we have built these products for a while, and we have you know many customers, big and small, and we have sort of the capability to support what would be best practices. So if it's a non-differentiated area and you're fighting uphill against our software, I mean maybe it makes sense, but but really take a hard look at it. And the third one is just, you know, the speed and the phasing I, I talked about. I mean, uh, more often than not, um, and, and this kind of bothers especially people in finance, but, but speed over accuracy is what's important. I don't mean get things wrong. I mean, too often we find projects that stall out or go late. Uh, and I can sort of tell now through experience early in the project when you've just got a long time making configuration decisions, making what goes first, what goes second decisions, how you handle certain nuances. I mean, the speed and having a, um, an infrastructure for faster and faster decision making, because both the phasing model, and frankly, you can course correct along the way, and, and then more than likely, your business problem is gonna change faster anyway. So, you know, there is no right or wrong decision. Now, there's a few in each individual area that make a big difference to you. But then there's hundreds in each individual area that are just, let's make a decision and let's move forward. If we got it slightly wrong, we can change that later. So, so the speed, because I feel like you'll discover it, you'll, you'll work with the software, um, and the analysis paralysis is, is um, probably our biggest component of, of where it's like, hmm, you know, we really got to coach the customer on how to, how, to, how to work with us through this. Amen to that as far as uh, the phasing of the, the project. So, so what advice do you have then for somebody who is in this situation where their organization is just looking at a, at a, a complex nightmare kind of project and they, they can't get people to listen? How, do, how can somebody in that situation sell the right thing, sell doing the right thing inside the company so that it turns out the way that everybody actually wants it to turn out. I mean, well, again, the, the, you know, the one is the repeat, which is try to break it down into uh, different phases so you can get actual use and get actual value. That, that, that um, it lessens the angst, I guess, and shows you hopefully some real return on it. You go there first thing. And the second thing is I think too often people confuse uh, inactivity uh, as being the less risky path. Uh, and in today's environment, in many, many industries and many, many companies, you know, this disruptive forces or just the pressure from our customers' customers to, you know, better respond to their needs, you know, we need to move more quickly. We, you know, ourselves and we are, are our customers. And I think too often the folks who are, well, this is just really too much and it's going to be too risky and we got to do this, that, you know, in our mind, a lot of times what gets underestimated is the risk of that lack of speed decision making or that risk of, of going, uh, because that's what leads you into this route of like, you know, the, the mess isn't going to get any smaller. And of course, with uh, the cloud, it's much easier to do these phase projects as you're describing. And really, that's the right way to go about it. In my view. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, we're going to give you frequent updates. You can add features, frequent updates, and even if you have everything you need today, there's no reason. In many cases, you can't get there incrementally. And I, I'll just be repeating myself, uh, but it's better value. Get people used to it, et cetera, et cetera. And in our last uh, minute or two, any thoughts specifically on ERP implementations, or it's basically that's the advice that you've you've just been giving us. Yeah, that's the advice. I, I think with ERP, what's happening is, um, you know, in, in, in some of the other areas, we've had the, let's call it the benefit of, of other competitors um, either out in front or talking about the, the, the transformative need and change. I would say in ERP, you know, um, we've been able to 
uh, draft, if you will, to use a, a cycling or running term, right, off all the lessons learned of everybody else in cloud. So ERP, we tend to get more questions around security and privacy and, um, you know, the robustness of the software. You know, we are extremely confident we are there now with some of our large customers who've converted over, that we are ready for this transformation. We are extremely confident that all of the benefits that customers have seen and the speed of innovation can be seen there for, for ERP. So I just think um, it's, I guess by its nature, probably got a, a little bit more conservative crowd and a little bit more higher bar to cross. But you know, I would give the same advice and just echo that, you know, there's a reason why we give it even for ERP. So you, so, so the, the point of acceptance of ERP among large customers is there getting there? I would classify it as getting there. I, 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 either getting there or there, and they're waiting for that, you know, well, what is going to be our change that, that, that starts this, this process? If we've just done an upgrade, you know, a year ago, it probably doesn't make sense, though they're, they're probably getting there. So it's somewhere in between, let's say, let's say in North America, it's there. Uh, let's say in the rest of the world, it's getting there. Steve Miranda, thank you so much for taking time to speak with us today. Thanks for having me, Michael. My pleasure. We have been talking with Steve Miranda, who is the Executive Vice President of Applications at Oracle. And you have been watching episode number 182 of CXO Talk. We have several shows next week, so check out the website, cxotalk.com slash episodes, and come visit us. Thanks so much. Bye-bye, everybody.